when you stay in Maui, right, you go, wow, right? <laughs> but you, you know, a couple weeks ago, the storm was coming and we were spared. But you know, we have uh, brothers and sisters up in Puna and they still don't even have electricity. Yeah? So, you know, in, in, our, in our wonderment, in the paradise that God blesses us in, uh, we need to always remember others and uh, how fortunate we stay but also that we can lift them up to the Lord. Um, Pastor Kipi talked a little bit earlier about the Middle East. And uh, I don't know if you've seen this symbol yet. Like that. Okay. Um, there's a, there, the, in Iraq, there's this symbol. It looked like fish hook, right? When I first saw it, that's what I, I said. Oh, why is my friend changing her Facebook to the fish hook? Yeah? Um, but it's the Iraqi symbol for N. And it's being used to mark the homes of Christians. And the Christians in towns in Iraq have now a choice. They can leave, they can denounce being a Christian, or they can pay a higher tax. And should they refuse any of them, then they'll have death by the sword under the Islamic faith. Um, and so what's now happening, it's a phenomena in a way, and things are going, where people are looking at this symbol and, you know, wearing it as, I am a Christian, I am a believer. And uh, yesterday we had an elders meeting and I was telling the pastor guys, you know, part of me immediately says, oh, I would wear that. I would wear that. I would wear it now, no problem. But would I wear it with a guy with a sword in his hand ready to chop my head off? Would I wear it with a gun to my head? Um, I'd like to say yeah, but I really won't know until that moment, yeah? Uh, what, what you do as a person, you don't know until then, but you can prepare and pray. And that's something Uncle Francis has been talking about lately too, is pre being preparing ourselves. Uh, Pastor Keepy's message is the basics. Preparing ourselves so that we know the Lord, so when those things come, we will be ready. And because of that, we can have more and more confidence about where we will stand with the Lord. So on Monday mornings, over at the... Uh, yeah, Marriott Courtyard. <laughs> we have soap. So, so for, uh, for those of you visiting us, our, is our scripture, our observation, our application, and our prayer on Life Journals. Life Journal is a method that we use to read the Word daily so we can come to know God's Word and live by God's Word daily. And they go to uh, Courtyard Marriott and uh, sit and share each other's stories uh, and how the application and how the Word is, is working in their life. On Tuesday nights up in Pukalani, we meet at Pastor Kipi's house for a word, uh, some fellowship, communion, okay? So we also have that available. And then on Wednesday nights, uh, Auntie Marlene is available. Go like this with your fan. Yeah, okay. Uh, for those of you who are suffering loss in your life, any a time of grieving or mourning, then uh, she's available to help you through that transition using uh, the Lord's words. On Thursday night, Ann and Jeff have a gathering at their place. Is Ann and Jeff here today? Okay. And then on Friday night, up at Pukalani again, we have Marvele is leading a woman's study. Uh, and then also on Wednesday night for men at 5.30, for the guys, there is a gathering called Moy, Men of Integrity. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of opportunity throughout the week to, to, uh, to gather with, uh, with other believers to learn and to share and to grow. So those are your opportunities that come up. And if you are a leader, a servant here at New Hope Kahului. Um, then immediately after church, I ask you to go to Theater 5. Uh, we just have a very short meeting um, about what's coming up on September 14th. <laughs> okay? So, uh, you know, if, if you're a leader or servant already, then come. And if you just like to know, <laughs> you can also come, all right? Uh, so on September 14th, uh, or it's a Theater 5. The other thing I want to share with everybody is that um, some people already, you smart, you bring your own fan already. And uh, this theater, we have been talking with, uh, with the management on this theater. And uh, we're working on, the, well, they're working on the fact that the roof is no good. 
it has to be replaced. The air conditioner is shot and they're negotiating with their corporate office on getting a new air conditioner. We are in discussion with them about um, having to go to another room because uh, we don't want to sit here for another couple months uh, in, without the air conditioning. Um, so, so we will be having some changes, but that is what's happening. Uh, that's why it gets warm in here. Uh, we, we did what we could and now we have more information and now we'll make further decisions about um, what theater we can meet in so that we can add a little bit to your comfort as well. Yes? Yeah. All right. Morning. Praise God. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> well, I want, I want to start with a story of a great hunter. This woman walked into her kitchen and saw her husband with a fly swatter. And he, she asked him, oh, what are you doing? And he said, I'm hunting flies. <laughs> yeah, did you kill any? Sure I did, five of them. Three males and two females. In three, she asked him, how could you tell which were males and which were females? Well, he said the, the three males were on a beer can, the two females were on a phone. Let's begin our, our lesson today with, with, with prayer. Let's all agree together in one accord and one spirit. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, we take dominion over every demonic spirit that may be in this building. We command you to release any minds that you have control, you are controlling or have influence. For. And in the name of Jesus, we command you to leave. Now, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. I know that I'm only the deliverer, but you are the Holy Spirit that reveals fresh revelation and understanding of the words that are being delivered. So right now, you have your way. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to grow in the knowledge of your word, to grow spiritually, so that we may be prepared for in times are hard, that we may trust in you and be totally and fundamentally strong in your word, that your word will dominate us more than what we feel or what we see. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, thank you. Okay, which, which camp are you in? <clears throat> One camp of believers says, all, um, once saved, always saved, that your spirit is perfected and sanctified forever, and that you confess faith in Jesus and you're born again, and that it is, it is because your faith in Jesus that you got saved, that sin is not an issue. Or you are in another camp of believers says that if you're lost, you must be saved. If you're lost again, you must be born again. If you say lost, born again, and again, and again, and again. They believe that sin is an issue, that in order to get to heaven, you must be saved and be holy. Now, both camps are, have partial truth in them, but it's not the entire answer. In order to find the answer, we must check with the Word of God and, and learn what, what, what is sin. What's, what is sin? So let's look at James 2.10. Okay, let's all read together. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So a, a plate glass is usually illustrated to, to uh, show what this scripture is talking about. If you shoot an air gun or a BB through a plate glass, you may cause a small hole. If you throw a chair through the plate glass, you could cause big damage. In either case, that plate glass needs to be replaced. If you violate one point of the law, you violate the whole law. So, what what it is saying that um, let's go to um, a Romans. Well, Romans 13 tells us that God commands us to obey the land of the law of the land. Also commands us to submit to governing authorities. So, 
a minor scene, maybe, maybe speeding, one mile over the speed limit. You go 46 miles in 45 mile per hour zone, you sin. Now, speeding is just as guilty as adultery. You say, what? Yes. It's man's, in man's eyes, there are, there is vertically different between speeding and adultery. But in God's, God's eyes, sin is sin. And we can look also that, you know, we may not be transgressing every command that God wants us to obey. There are things that we should be doing, good things that uh, are considered good and we should be doing and we're not doing. Let's go to um, James 4.17. James 4, 17. Let's all read together. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and do it not, to him it is a sin. How many of you, after shopping, return the cart to where you're supposed to belong? <laughs> or, or simply because it's too far, you just set it aside on the curb. And what about reading the Word of God when you know you should be reading, but instead uh, you turn on the TV, like me, to watch the news, see what's happening in this world, when you should actually be reading God's Word. So, you know, sin is not the issue. We know that, um, we, we, we know that, um, See, when I put notes over here, I don't put, I don't mark it down. I kind of get, get lost in my in my in my message. So we know that sin is is not an issue concerning salvation, because if anyone in here, if you would consider if you would die right now, knowing what sin is all about, would you go to heaven? Would you be in the presence of the Lord? No, we all we all have sin. We have unconfessed sins that we don't know we, we committed. So sin is not an issue. Your salvation is based on your faith in Jesus. And when you sin, your faith in Jesus doesn't go away. You still have faith in Jesus. Your born again spirit is sealed by the Holy Spirit from the effects of sin. Okay? So. Understanding spirit, soul, and body assures you of your salvation. Although sin does not cause us to lose our salvation, there is scripture that tells us, that teaches us, you can renounce, it's possible for you to renounce your salvation. And that's what we're gonna teach on to, uh, next week's Sunday, on Hebrews 6 verses 4, to six. That's the unpardonable sin of blessing, blasphemy. And you know, as we go along and, and learn to renew our minds, we need to practice now. We can't wait until it's the time is upon us. You know, a wise man prepares for a storm when he sees it coming. It's not the physical preparation, but God's word is spirit. What is flesh is flesh, what is spirit is spirit. When he speaks to you, when he speaks his word, it's about the spirit. So you prepare, not physically, you prepare yourself to trust God. You prepare yourself to rely on God to get you through the storm or what is coming. Okay? So again, this teaching is to call you to grow in your spiritual walk and also to cause you to to know that God really loves you. He's making it's not easy for you to renounce your salvation. He makes it once he got he got you, you're a child of the most high God. He doesn't want to lose you. But you have a choice. You can renounce your faith. You can renounce and reject Jesus. 
and as a result, lose your salvation. Thank you. Praise God. God bless all of you. Have a great day. All the time too. I just was talking to somebody recently about this whole being born again, again and again and again and again, and then I'm following and born again, and then like if I die, if I'm saved, but then I'm a backslider, or if I fall away and I die in that state, then ah, oh, then just you know disqualify and go straight to hell. And um, it's not, it's not, it's not the truth. And so what we want to do is just speak the truth because it's nothing that you ever did that made you. Say nothing that you ever did that has ushered salvation into heaven. It's all believing and having faith in what Jesus Christ did. Is that correct? Yes. So nothing you do is going to get you out. It's just it, 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 it's it's because of what Jesus did is what ushers us in. Now, as we're born again and as we're saved and as we're filled with the Holy Spirit, if we start sinning, it it just breaks us down. It's like this little thing that just eats away at us. All of a sudden, we separate ourselves from God. We separate ourselves from other people. We separate ourselves. And it just kind of pushes us far off. But if you were to die, if you were truly born again, then you're in. If you're truly born again, you really love Jesus, you really receive the finished work on the cross, then you're His. And there's nothing that, that you or anybody else can do to get you out of that. Except for, Uncle Francis is going to share that there's one thing that, that we should know. And... Um, Okay, that's not even the message, but I just wanted to say that that's really exciting. Thank you, Uncle Francis. Thank you for all of us. What we're going to do now is we're going to have a baby dedication. Our church is growing one baby at a time. Praise the Lord. It's amazing. And, uh, and what we want to do is, is uh, uh, saw Bianca, if you could, oh, there you were. If you could come up and um, we're going we're gonna to speak blessing over Mariah this morning and just dedicate her to the Lord. This is always a wonderful wonderful time as we do this together as a church and it's it always is important for us to remember that as we dedicate um, the, the child and as we dedicate our babies this is something that you can do at home all the time as well something that I do all the time so when I'm when I pray over my sons and when you pray over Mariah you can just always it just the prayer is this the prayer is this before we used to say this oh God bless my baby and bless my child and like bless my child and my child and like Lord can you please love my child as much as I love my child you know stuff like that it's just it's it's not accurate when we say this Lord this child belongs to you you know everything about this little one you know everything about her future you know everything about her potential you wove her together in her mama's womb you put everything together and when we dedicate her we say Lord She's yours. So we just like we, we give it into the Lord's hand and the Lord holds her. He holds her and we stand together as a church. We say, Lord, she's yours. She's beautiful. She is a blessing. Thank you that you've chosen us as parents to raise her up. Thank you that you've chosen Sunshine to be her older sister. Thank you. It's, and then the Lord says, okay, we've dedicated her. We understand who she is, who she belongs to. And then the Lord just places her back into her her parents' hands, just like the Lord would do for all of our children as well. When we dedicate our babies to the, to the Lord, it's, it's actually His. But then it, when, when the child returns to us, she has this anointing and this favor because we understand that we are called to steward over our children, to love our children unconditionally. But ultimately, our babies and our children belong to the Lord. And that, in the future, as you know, we talked about that last week in Psalm 91, it ushers great peace to remember that these children, your children, our children, and this child belongs to Jesus. Could we stand together, church? Please, together. All right. And would you stretch out your right hand towards this little one as we, as we pray over Sai, Bianca, and Ryan? Father, we thank you, Lord, for this little one. We pray a blessing right now as we dedicate Mariah, Reen, Kulia, Kevelino, Kialoha, Levehi, Okamamalu. Foster. Lord, we thank you that she is yours. We thank you for the unconditional love that you have for her. We thank you for the plans that you have for her, Lord. And we pray this morning, as we dedicate her to you, Lord God, that we understand that she belongs to you and that she has your blessing, that your face would continue to shine down upon her, that she would be blessed in all that she does, that she would be supernaturally protected in all that she does and everywhere that she goes. I pray, Lord, that you would... You would even pull out all the potential, all the blessings that is within her that you have placed there, Lord, that she would live a life living for you, Lord God, that when she is of age, that she would call upon the name of Jesus, that she would call you, Lord. Father, I pray for Sa'a and Bianca as well, Lord, that we're so thankful that you've chosen them to be her parents. 
and that you would bless them supernaturally as well to speak life into her, to bless her, that she would be all that you've created her to be. We thank you, Lord, for that. We give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 And as I watch the news, I'm not a big person on the news, but as I see things happening in our world, um, I'm disturbed and I'm bothered. Hopefully, I'm not sure if you're bothered when you see some of the things that are happening in the world, but there's a lot going on. A lot going on. And when I, when I look at it, and I start to think about, like, man, what does that mean? What does that mean for me? What does that mean for my family? What does that mean for my community? How am I going to adjust or how, what am I going to do about these things? Am I going to do anything about it or am I going to do nothing about it? Can I do something about it? I don't know what to do. And, I, and there's just so many things that, that my mind is just tracking through. That when I look at my children thinking like, man, Lord, thank you that you've blessed me with this place of, of security where other parents in the world have their own children that are not secure. In fact, there's tragedy going on. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Do, do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. So, that's the kind of thing that, I'm, that I deal with. And I'm wondering if some of you deal with that as well. Especially as you look around. I mean, it doesn't even have to be in the Middle East. It could be anything that, that, you're, that you're facing, anything that you're dealing with. And I just wanted to start off with a very, very simple passage of Scripture. And that is to trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding, but in all your ways. All your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Very, very simple passage of scripture, one that we talk about all the time, one that many of us who have followed the Lord for, for many years, we kind of feel like that's in our back pocket, like, yeah, give me something new and fresh, because like I knew that when I was a kid, so teach me something new. But the fact of the matter is that God's word is living, and every single time we read these scriptures, it becomes alive to us in our current situations. We're going to take a look at this video real quick, and I'll see you on the other end of it, but let's, um, let's take a look at this and just seeing how we should trust God in all the things that we do. I just don't trust you. You don't trust me? No, I mean, I want to trust you, I just don't. <laughs> I have an exercise that I think will really help you. Oh, okay. Stand here and face this direction. Mm -hmm. Now, do you trust me? Uh, no, I just said I don't trust you. All right, well, this is all part of the exercise. Oh, all right. right. Okay. Whenever I ask you if you trust me, you say, yes, Jesus, I trust you. Even though I don't. It's practice. Okay. So, do you trust me? <laughs> Yes, Jesus, I trust you. Now, fall back. Are you going to catch me? Don't worry about that part. Okay, that's the part I'm worried about. <laughs> you can do this, okay? Just trust me. Trust you. Fall back. Okay, well, Jesus, I trust Good. you. Yes, I do trust you. I'm going to fall okay. back. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's great. Uh, okay. Let's try this again. Just face this direction and keep your feet planted, okay. all right? Do you trust me? Yes, Jesus, I trust you. Now, fall back. Okay, I'm gonna do it. All right. I'm really gonna do it. <laughs> okay. Good. Ah! Oh, Jesus, you really caught me! I didn't think you were gonna catch me, but you did! Oh, that was great! <laughs> that was great! You're ready for level two! Level two, here yes. I come, baby! Woo! Oh. <laughs> Whoa! Okay, hold it. <laughs> oh, you know what? You're too close. You need to move back. <laughs> ah, right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> This one's a little bit different, Laura. Oh, okay. Uh, stand here. Uh huh. But face me. Oh, forward fall. Okay. I can do that. Wait. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Um, wait for my signal. Oh, right. The Jesus signal. <laughs> yes, the okay. Jesus signal. Do you trust me? Yes, Jesus. I trust you so much. Good. Fall back. <laughs> That's awesome. It is awesome. <laughs> Especially when you do it. <laughs> Seriously? Of course. Okay, Jesus. I don't know if you noticed this, but there is nobody over there. I know it looks that way to you. It looks that way. It is that way. You can do this, Laura. Just trust me and fall back. <laughs> Jesus, I can't do that. We can do it together. I can't. You can. I won't. All right. So these are some of the open-ended kind of videos that we watch. And then we see ourselves in these places. Jesus has asked us to trust him, and some of us will, and unfortunately, some of us will not. Why? Because the things that we see, the things that are, that are, that are in front of us, are just more real 
in Jesus. The things that we're challenged with, the things that we can see, hear, taste, smell, or feel are more real than the Word of God. And that's a tragedy. But the thing is that God wants to speak to every single one of our hearts this morning. He wants to tell us through a story of the kind of person that is weak. And not all of you are weak, but many of us are weak. But did you know that when we are weak, that's when He's strong? When we are weak and we show up for a battle and there's just us and there's like a whole of just a, an army of the enemy and we just show up because we're being obedient to the Lord if, if it's you plus Jesus you will always make up a majority you plus God always makes up a majority so we're going to take a look at the story of Gideon Gideon is going to teach us a wonderful lesson this morning and I pray that it blesses and speaks to every single one of our hearts um, I was preparing a message and um, and this just, just came upon me in, in just a strong, strong way. And I just know, my prayer is always this, by the way. Lord, please speak to your children. Please speak to your people what you would want them to, to hear, what you would want them to know, what, you just, what your word is. And so if I try to prepare things on my own, then it just, it, it, it just feels it's okay, but it just is not right. And sometimes the Lord just shows up and says, this is my word, and this is what I want you to speak. And so I believe that we're all going to be very blessed this morning. And uh, let's pray before we get into the word. Father, we thank you for your word, and we know that it is absolutely truth. And we know by your word, Lord, that you would lead us, that you would guide us, that you would counsel us, that you would mentor us, that you would lead us in all of your ways. So we thank you for that, Lord, in advance for what you're going to do. Would you transform our hearts, Lord? Would you give us ears to hear you and eyes to see you this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to start at, at um, uh, Judges 7, and we're going to start at verse 1. Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him, rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod, so that, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them, by the hill of Moriah in the valley. Okay, so we're already, we're going to get started. Uh, Gideon is facing the Midianites, okay? And so in this story, the Midianites is going to represent evil, represent demonic forces, going to represent the enemy of our souls, okay? That's what the Midianites is going to represent. Um, and if you're a reader of the Bible, which I know uh, many of you are, you would know that Moses in the past defeated the Midianites. Israel just broke down Midian, uh, the Midianites and they conquered Midian, the Midianites. But what happens is over time, especially in the book of Judges, this is one thing that they said all the time, is that the people did what was right in their own eyes. And the people did what was right in their own eyes. And every single time they did that, they took their focus off of God, did whatever they wanted to do, and the nation just crumbled. And God raised up a judge and saved all the people, and they forgot God, and they crumbled again. And it happens all the time. So what happens is the Midianites is, is representing or representative of that thing that was destroyed and, and demolished long ago, but it pops its head back up again. You know, for many of us, we have certain sins that we have dealt with in the past, and we feel like it's done, it's finished, it's completed, I've, I've put that aside, and like now I'm free of that. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it just kind of like pops its head up, just like a, like a, like a turtle, it just kind of pops its head up here and there, and all of a sudden we're like, wait a minute, I thought I, I got over the addiction of alcohol, or I thought that, that my smoking habit was done and, and completed and like I already killed it. Why has it come back up again? Why is it in front of me again? And you know, I have a, I have a, a very good friend and he was on uh, pain, pain pills, you know, doing that, that whole thing. And um, he destroyed it. He was walking free of it for several, several years. And the moment his um, PO told him, okay, you don't have to check in, you're all good, um, go out and do your very best, that next day he was tempted and he fell again. In our lives, we're going to have uh, victories and we're going to defeat things. And if we're not careful, and if we're not prayed up, and if we're not staying focused on the Lord, those things has a tendency to come back up and pop up right in front of our faces again. And so the Lord is going to give us a word this morning to be able to defeat some of these things. And this is just the beginning. And so the Midianites represent strife. It represents troubles. It represents trials. So this is what Gideon is up against. Gideon is leading an army, and they're up against strife. They're up against the armies of the enemy that are trying to come against them and destroy them. Okay? And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. So 
So God says to Gideon, okay, I know you guys have a whole bunch of people here, and I know you're facing the Midianites who are about 135,000 people, but you guys just got too much people. And the amount of people that, that Gideon was leading, if one Israelite would have to defeat four Midianites for them to win. But God says, there's too many of you guys. Because if you folks go and you fight, you guys could possibly say that the victory is mine. The victory belongs to me. And this is, this is a picture. When God is glorified, God, God's odds are always going to be a little off kilter. He's always going to do things, like, like I was saying, you plus God. Not you plus God plus a, an army plus somebody who can do this and plus somebody who can do that. It's going to just be you and God. So when God is glorified, when God's work is done, when we look back, we say, man, it was really the Lord who did all these things. Much too often we say this, we say, oh Lord, yeah, good thing you chose me because I'm going to do a mighty work for you. I'm going to do an amazing work for you, Lord. You've chosen me and woohoo, you did a good job, right? And we think, oh God, I'm going to do you such a great, a great work. And it's totally opposite. It's totally opposite. We have to say, Lord, I'm weak and I'm broken and there's so many things about me that, that I just, I, I don't even, why would you choose me? And the reason why he chose his broken vessels like us is because he gets the glory. When the thing gets done, when it's accomplished, he gets the glory. And that's why pride will always bring people down because they think, I don't even need God. Like, I, I'll do this. And that's, through the book of Judges, that's exactly what happens. They always did according to what was good in their own eyes. And that was not giving God the glory. And as a result, they, they were in this, this up and down uh, valley all the time. Okay, So now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are still, uh, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Okay, so here we go. Gideon is leading people, and all of a sudden the Lord is just subtracting. The Lord is taking, taking the, the soldiers away. And if you're trying to do something for the Lord, if you're trying to take care of your family, a lot of times we, we go through this. Lord, I want to take better care of my children because I'm just not home all the time. And then all of a sudden you have this feeling like, well, then you have to leave your job. And, and you're like, what? Like, I can't leave my job. Like, how am I going to provide for everybody? I, I got to take care of my kids, but I got to go to work. And it's like this, this balancing act. And the Lord says, no, no, no. If you're going to trust me, then trust me and make the right steps. And even though it doesn't make sense, even though it doesn't look right, when you're trusting the Lord, he starts to, it feels like he's subtracting. But he's not subtracting. He's actually adding on to you because he is always in the presence. So that's what we see here. Okay, and so, uh, and then the Lord says he is going to do the choosing. The, what's going on right now is that, there's, that people are going to go through a testing period, a testing season in their lives. Many of us are going through a testing season in our life. And so the Lord is going to reveal some things to us and it's going to be... Wonderful. Then it will be that, um, let me start again from uh, verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many, and bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with, with his tongue, as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down, uh, everyone who gets down on his knee needs to drink. And the number of those who lap, putting their hand to their mouth, was three hundred men. Then all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, "By the three hundred men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place." So this is what God is doing. God is putting people through a test, and they don't even know that they're being tested. Did you know that you and I, in many ways, God has always been testing us. God has always been watching us. God has always been, been just, just leading us and guiding us. And if you notice, even the people that are fearful, he says, you guys can go home. It's okay. But he's never mad at them. He doesn't say, what's wrong with you, you fearful people? How dare you? He doesn't say any of that stuff. He says, if they're fearful... Then, then let them go home. And then he says, bring them all to the water. And those who get on their, their knees and they start lapping it like a dog, right? He says, okay, let those guys alone. And those who are, who are lapping it like this, bringing the, the, their hand to their mouth, the Lord says, those 300 men, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use them to deliver the Midianites into your hand. This is a place in our lives, church, <coughs> excuse me, 
that God is always testing us whether we know it or not. The way that you treat your employees at work, God is watching. Because if you can treat them well, he'll know that you can treat others well who he'll put under your care. As a parent, he's always watching us. All the things that we do, God is always watching us. And we think that, oh, well, nobody can see me anyway, so I can get away with all these things. And one place in my life where I've noticed that there seems to be, for me, a test is rubbish on the ground. And as a gentleman, you know, they all, were always told, like, pick up the, the opala and, you know, throw it away. You know, ball up a cup, I know. You know, right? All that kind of stuff, right? And we, and we want to do that, but sometimes things are just out of my way. And I just see, like, like something on the ground, and it just bothers me. And it's out of my way, and I'm like, oh. And I just go, and I pick it up, and I'll throw it away. I'll be in the bathroom, and I'll see, like, like just paper towels on the ground. And I'm like, oh. And just just me. And for some reason, I, I just, I, so I get, a, I get paper towels in my hand, I pick up all these paper towels, and I put it away, and I wipe down the counter in the bathroom. Just me. Just me in the bathroom. Nobody can see me. Nobody, nobody can say, wow, good job. You're, you're, so, you're, you're such a clean person, right? And, and my wife would, would definitely say otherwise, but we're, we won't talk about that. But the thing is, like, for me, in this season of my life, I feel like that is some form of... Uh, of, of a testing period. I don't know why, and I, I can't even prove that that's true. But why I'm saying that is because probably chances are in your life, there's something there. There's something that the Lord is testing you. Maybe it's like when you feel this urge to call somebody to encourage them, you're like, oh, I know I should, but man, should I? I know I should, but just do it. Or maybe the Lord is just saying something to you, and you notice something, and you know you can do it. And sometimes you do it, and sometimes you don't. So whatever that is in, in your heart and in your life, I want to encourage you to pass that test. And the reason why we want to pass the test is because chances are, if you don't pass that test, God, will, God won't be mad at you, and he won't, he won't judge you, He won't kill you. But what happens is, if we don't pass the test that, that God puts in front of us, we'll just get back in line one day, and we'll just face the same tests all over again. Sometimes it's looking for a new house. We're looking for a new place. We're looking for a new job. And we're like, Lord, I trust you, right? I trust you. And the Lord says, do you trust me? I said, yeah, okay, well, then just fall back. It's like, but wait a minute. Like, where am I going to find the person? Or where am I going to work at? Or how am I going to do this? And the Lord says, do you trust me? I say, yes, I trust you. Okay, well, then just rest and fall back. But for whatever reason, we don't do that. We just go around. We try to figure things out for ourselves. And like, where am I going to work? How is it going to work? Lord, how are you going to make these things happen? And we need all the logistics before we trust God. And that's backwards. And it's wrong. And that's, it's never going to work. You're going to find yourself doing donuts for the rest of your life if we don't learn to change now and to pass that test. So God is asking you to pass a test, which means that certain things need to change. Certain things that you used to believe before, we have to now, instead of believing in your effort, believing in, in your skill, believing in the people that you know, believing in your job, believing in your husband or your wife, we have to cancel all of that and just believe in God and just trust Him, truly trust Him, genuinely trust Him. So that's, that's what the Lord is speaking to us um, through this passage of Scripture. And so it goes on to say this, It happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. So here's, here's Gideon, right? And he's trying to work for the Lord. He's trying to do his very best for God. And so are we. We're trying to do the very best for God. And all of a sudden, there's this subtraction issue happening. And the Lord is taking things away. The Lord is taking resources away. And you know what we say to God all the time? Lord, do you understand my odds? Do you understand my odds? How am I going to do this? How am I going to pay for all my bills when I only have like a part-time job? How am I going to make that happen? Do you understand the odds that I'm up against? How am I going to make this relationship work with my mother? Because everything says that she will never change. She's always going to be a knucklehead. She's always going to be mad at me. She's always going to blame me for everything or whatever it is. And we just say, Lord, do you understand the odds? Do you understand the odds that I'm up against? And the Lord says, yeah, I, I completely understand the odds that you're up against. And again, the Lord is showing us that in our weakness, that's when we're strong and we're trusting in Him. Because He shows up, and we cannot deny the fact that everything was healed, everything was reconciled by His Word and by His power. So God gets our odds. He says, yeah, I understand that you're at odds, but trust me. That's what He keeps saying. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. All right? And so he, he tells Gideon to go down into the camp. And then he says this, But if you're afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. And afterward, your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp, against the army. Bless you. Then he went down with Pura, 
uh, his servant to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. Now the Midianites and Amalekites, all, all the people of the, of the east, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number, and the sand by the seashore in multitude. Okay, so, so we're just gonna, we're gonna take a look at this picture. So, so God says, go down to the camp and, and just go down there and I'm gonna deliver them into your hand. I'm gonna strengthen you, I'm gonna strengthen you. So, so Gideon goes down with his servant, okay? He goes down and when he looks, when he looks at this valley, all he sees is people, just people everywhere, camels and, and this army, this vast, vast army. And it looks like impossible odds. It is just, I mean, it's impossible. It's impossible odds. It's like, holy smokes, there's like so much going on here. I only have 300 men. But Gideon is just still following the Lord. And Gideon has issues with fear. And God knows it. And, and God says, if, you, if you're kind of fearful, then take your servant with you. And, 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 God allows, and God allows him to do that. Okay? This is going to be really important because the picture is this. Gideon is walking down, walking down the valley, and there's just a billion places to go. A billion people to talk to, a billion things that are going on, and so he, he's going down into into the camp, into the army, okay? And this is what happens. He gets he hears this prophetic word. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian, and it came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. And to his hand, God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. So of all the places, okay, of all the places that Gideon could have gone to, he just so happens, of a billion places to be, he just so happens to come upon this camp, upon this tent, where he can hear the people talking about him. Then he can hear this dream and hear the interpretation of the dream. This is, is a picture of all of us of being at the right place at the right time. Um, we talked about Elijah before and his place called there. When there was a drought and everybody was, was, um, was suffering from this famine and this drought, God told Elijah, Elijah, go down to the brook Cherith and I will send my ravens and they will feed you there. They will feed you there. So he didn't say go up to the to the caves and go make on fire and, and like and go hunting and stuff like that. Or he didn't say go and go fish and go find some fish or something like that. God said just go to the brook Cherith and I will feed you there. Of all the places on planet Earth, go to this one place and I will feed you there. And that's exactly what he does for Gideon. He says, Gideon, go down. And when he's there, Gideon receives this prophetic word. He hears this prophetic word and he hears that the enemy is scared because they know that God is coming. They know that God is going to deliver deliver the enemy into the hands of Gideon. And so he's encouraged. And he says, wow, like, thank you so much, Lord. Like, now I'm encouraged. Now my, my sword, now I'm, now I'm ready to rock because I believe and I trust that, Lord, you're going to deliver the enemy into my hand. But the first thing that Gideon does when he receives this word, when he receives this prophetic word, is, is that, and by the way, for all of us, you know, even being at the right place at the right time has in the past has saved lives. We, we've seen that how many times being at the right place at the right time. And Uncle Francis and Auntie Francis tell a wonderful story of their son Kavika, who was in this, in this foxhole. And uh, they, were, they were shooting rockets and, and, and they were in Afghanistan at, at war, during the time of war. And he was in this foxhole, he and a friend, and he, he just left. Somebody had called him and said, hey, can you help us over here? So he got out of the foxhole, right? He walked away, and as he's walking away, a mortar or some missile or something came right into that, that foxhole where they're at, and it just, boom! And it just went off, and it, it blew them from, from, from the back. But they were saved, and they were rescued, and they were just protected by God. And I remember that these are one of the first encounters that I had with Uncle Francis. And I remember thinking to myself, in, in my own pride, and so I, I apologize, right? I, I was like, yeah, I know God. And like, I read the Bible all the time. And like, God speaks to me. And like, woohoo, right? But then while I was talking to Uncle Francis, he started tearing. And he started raising his hands. We're at Minute Stop in Pukalani. And he started raising his hands and just praising God. And said, thank you, Lord. He's just crying. Thank you for blessing my son. Thank you for watching over my son. Thank you for blessing him to be at the right place at the right time. And that is a word for all of us. We always want to be at the right place at the right time. God's timing, His, His, His appointments, everything. We want to be at the right place at the right time. 
And so anyway, Uncle Francis, we, we shared this, this, this story and I got to know his heart. And of course, um, since then to now, we, we continue to serve the Lord together. And I continue to learn from him uh, every single day. What, what a blessing. And so um, Gideon gets this word. He hears the enemy talking amongst themselves like, man, we're going to get dosed. Like the, God is going to come in and he's going to deliver all of us. And we're going to get completely like, annihilated, right? And it's not the first time that that's happened. Rahab also had that happen to her too when, when the spies of, of Israel came and she said, we've heard about you folks. We've heard about, the, uh, we've heard about God and like, how God works with you, Israel. We've heard of all the things that you've done. And we know that when you come, God comes with you. So even though there's just a few of you, we know that God is behind you. And wherever God is, he will do the work that he's going to do. And, and so even she knew. The enemy knows that God is powerful. The enemy knows that God is coming. And we all know that the Lord is with every single one of you. And so this is what Gideon does. He could have did all these different things, but you know what Gideon does? Is he stops and he worships. He just worships the Lord. He just says, thank you, Lord. And he gives his heart to the Lord. And there's a, a wonderful picture there for all of us. That's exactly what we should be doing all the time. We should be people who live a life of worship. Did you know that when we're preaching the Word of God, we're preaching the Word of God so that we can be filled with, with the Word of God so that we could live a life of worship. Could you imagine that like, everything that you do was just to glorify God? And some of you would say, like, you know what, I'm busy. I don't have time to go sit in my garage and like, play some my guitar and like, worship the Lord. Or, or get my tambourine and ching, 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 right? All these kind of things. Or, and, and so I don't have time to worship the Lord. But that's not true. Every single one of us have time to worship the Lord. If you're making lunches for your for your, your kids, it's a form of worshiping the Lord. You just put the make the sandwich together and say, Lord, everything that I'm doing, I'm doing unto you. You put that sandwich in a little plastic bag and you bless it, you put it in, in, in the in the package, you cut some oranges and say, Lord, I'm doing all these things as unto you. It turns us into people of worship. When you're driving, you're just, just worshiping. Lord, thank you for the things that I have. Thank you for the protection. Thank you for this beautiful day. I see you in the sun. I see you in all these things. And I worship you. When we're at church, and some of you may disagree with me, and that's okay, because if you do, that would just make you wrong. But um, when we're at church, did you know the most important time of church is when we're worshiping God? When we are just giving to God what belongs to Him. When we are reflecting His glory back to Him. Because it's His. Learning about God's Word, it just teaches us how to be that kind of person. How to receive and so how to live a life of worship. Worship is, is, is so, so, so tremendously important. And so, um, okay, so let's, let's, let's continue on. We thank you, Lord, for that word. And so uh, he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet into every man's hand, that's very important, with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. That's also very important. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do, uh, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the, and the hundred men who were with him came into the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, which is about 10 o'clock in the p.m., just as they had posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then the three um, companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp. And the whole army ran and cried out and fled. So this is how God is going to defeat the Midianites. This is how God is going to defeat the enemy. Okay? So there's 300 of them. And Gideon says, okay, guys, guess what? God is going to deliver all these enemies. You see, you look into this valley, you see billions of people. They're just everywhere. God is going to deliver them into our hands. And you know what the 300 men do? They believe him. They say, okay, I believe you. And so he gives everyone a, a, a trumpet, and he gives every single one of them a, 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 this, this like a vase, like an earthen vessel. It's kind of like a clay pot, and he gives them a torch. And so 100 over here, 100 over there, and 100 over here, 300 all together. And so he says, okay, when you hear me blow the trumpet and break, break my pot, then that's what I want you to do. And then I want you to declare by the word of God, by the sword of God, and of Gideon. Okay? And so that's exactly what they do. When the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. 
and the army fled to Bethakaya, uh, toward uh, Zerara, as far as the border of Abel Mehola, sorry. And the men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh and pursued the Midianites. Okay. This is super, super cool. So this is, this is what, uh, we understand the story, right? So 300 of them, they surround the camp. All of these people in this camp, they want to kill the Israelites. They want to kill the families of the 300 men. They want to chop off their heads. They want to cut them in half. They want to do all this evil to God's people. But God says, just trust me. Do you trust me? And they say, yes, yes, I trust you. And so 300 here, 300 there, and 300 here. And so what they do is they break the pots, they break these pots, pop, and then they, they blow this, the, this trumpet, and that happens in all these three places. And as a result, the people in the camp, the, keep, the people, the evil army, they get a, a frightened and they get scared, and they take out their swords, and they don't even know what they're doing, and as they're trying to find their way back into where they belong, they start slashing everybody in their sight. So now there's just an army, this evil army, and now what they're doing is they're killing themselves. It's just like blood, blood everywhere. They're just, they're just harming themselves. And that's how God is going to deliver them into their hands. And that's, that's, again, let's remember this, is that this is a picture, the Midianites is a picture of strife. The Midianites is a picture of trouble in your life. The Midianites is a picture of strife and tribulation, all these things in your life. And the Lord is revealing to us how it is, what do we do to defeat this strife, to defeat the Midianites in your own life, okay? And so this is, this is what's, what's, what's so, so awesome. <coughs> Excuse me. This is what's so awesome, is that when they, when they, when they break the, um, the, the, this pot, there's a lamp, there's a torch inside the pot. So in the beginning, everything is dark. Everything around the camp is dark. But then finally, they blow the trumpet and they break the pot, okay? And when the pot breaks, there's a light, there's a torch inside the pot. And so the, the, the light starts to shine out of this, of, this, of this pot, okay? And then they blow the trumpet and they say, by the sword of God and of Gideon. And as a result, all that chaos broke out and the Lord just wiped out the Midianites. And those who escaped, the Israelites chased them down. But this is, the, this is what it means. These pots, well, you know what, let's, just, let's move to um, 2 Corinthians 4. And the Lord, uh, the Bible interprets the Bible. Amen? Amen. And so we're going to take a look at what these pots represent, who these pots are, and what they mean to us. Okay? So let's start at um, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels or earthly pots that we've just seen being cracked, cracked and broken open, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. This is the, the spiritual picture that God is giving to us. These earthen vessels that, 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 were, that was being cracked, without it being broken, the light that was inside, you cannot see it. Jesus Christ lives where? Inside of who? Say me. Okay, good. Yeah, inside of all of you. The Lord lives inside of every single one of us. Uncle Francis teaches us about spirit, soul, and body. The Spirit of God lives inside of you. Did you know that you're a temple? That you are the temple of God? And that God resides inside of you? The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. If we are born again, we've called upon Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior. He lives inside of you. Not only does He live inside of you, but He says He'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's why the horrible thing about sinning is that not only that we sin and it's horrible and it's evil and it's bad and it pulls us down and it, it, it pulls us away from, from the fellowship with God, but the whole time Jesus is right there with us. Every time Jesus is right there with you. 
it's like bringing a little kid, like bringing a little three-year-old kid, and like if you're if you're a guy and you and, and you watch pornography, right? It's just that you bring this kid, like oh hey kid, like you put him on on, on the, next to you, and you just start clicking, click, 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 and you watch all these things just as if he's right there with you. Oh well, yeah, don't don't mind me. I'm just gonna just doing all this stuff. That alone should it should bother you, okay? That should bother <laughs> that should bother you. But the thing is, when we're sinning, Jesus is with us. He he says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And so when you walk into the door of a place that you don't belong, He's right there with you. When you start talking in a certain way to somebody and you know you shouldn't, and you know you shouldn't use that authority to hurt people, but you are, you're just doing that, Jesus is right there with you. When you're speaking death into your children, and I pray that, uh, that none of you do this, but for people that we know, if they're speaking death into their children, say, what's wrong with you guys? You guys are a bunch of idiots. Like, you guys are going to end up in jail. You know what I mean? And just speaking that kind of death, Jesus is right there with us the whole time. That is, the, that is the thing about sin that, that, that for me, it, it's, it, it causes me to always think twice. And am I perfect? No, I, I'm not perfect. Sometimes it, I, I might say something or do something and then immediately I have to just repent and say, Oh, Lord, forgive me. That's not my heart. Man, that's my old patterns. That's how I used to act. That's the kind of stuff I used to do. I'm like, what's wrong? Like, why can't I just kind of... You know, and then we spend time with the Lord in that way. And He tweaks us up and He fixes us up. And praise the Lord because many of us have grown. But it's in those moments of those broken vessels. And the thing is, we break it. We, we, we have to go through those broken places. And when we break that vessel, that, that clay jar, it's, it's, it's this earthen vessel, it says. It's an earthen vessel. And we are the earthen vessel. But when people see God, is when people see you going through what you're going through, and they see how you respond. What's inside of you? What's inside of you? How will you respond to these situations? How are you going to respond when all of a sudden I don't have a job and I don't have a place to live? Am I going to fall apart like a $2 suitcase? Or am I going to trust God? Am I going to say, like, man, you know what? My situation is horrible. Oh my gosh, I have no idea how it's going to work. And you have two options. Either you can start cursing God and say, like, why did you have this happen to me? Or you can just say, you know what, Lord? I believe in you. And I believe in your word. And I'm going to trust in you. The Lord says, you trust me? Then, then fall back, right? And we're like, okay. And then we fall back. And then all of a sudden, people see that. And they see the light that's inside of you. And that's the whole idea of passing these tests that we go through. Passing these, these tests. Because like, when you watch the news, it, it, it has this tendency of fear. What, what's happening right now is that everything, all these banners that go across, is trying to instill fear into all of us. And I, I, I believe we all kind of know that. I think it was yesterday in the front new in the in the front page it said Russia and Ukraine and like the Ebola and like all these ISIS people cutting people in half and chopping off heads and like and it said something like you know all the things that are happening in, in in the world have not affected us yet right and it's just kind of there's a sense of if if you read it you can become fearful you can become fearful you can all of a sudden begin to be like oh well, what am I going to do about this I can't even do anything about it. But it's not true. You can do something about it because there's a light that lives inside of you. His name is Jesus Christ. And he, that light can overtake everything. And it's going to start by overtaking the fears that we have. If any of us are fearful, I just, right now, I just pray against it right now. In fact, in Jesus' name, I speak against any kind of fear that comes against any of us. And I break that fear off. And Lord, we trust in you. And we know that your perfect love casts out all fear. So if we have any kind of fear, Lord, we know that your complete, your complete love, your perfect love is not completely inside of us. So we pray for it. And we receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. We have to we have to have this kind of heart. We have to have this place where we break this earthen vessel that Jesus comes out. It's kind of, you know, they, they say this before, right? It's like, we're all like a tube of toothpaste, right? And it's like, whatever's inside of you, when you're squeezed, <laughs> blah, right, right? whatever comes out is whatever was inside, right? And so many of our lives, too, we get tested all the time. And, like, life is normal, and so we're all, like, just normal. We're just kind of, like, good and healthy and plump. But then as soon as life squeezes, blah, right? Wh whatever comes out is what was already inside. And so we want Jesus Christ to be magnified and glorified through the challenges, through the trials, through the tribulations, that's what Midian represents, that kind of strife, that kind of trouble. And even though we're faced with these things, even though we're persecuted, even though these things come against us, it's not the end. Jesus, you plus Jesus, makes a majority every single time. Amen? Amen.
Amen. And so the last thing we, we see is with this trumpet, right? So they blow the trumpet. They blow the trumpet. And, and what, they're, what, what this symbolizes is that they're making proclamation and declaring Jesus Christ, declaring his goodness, declaring who he is. And many of us, if you blow, if you blow this trumpet, we're just saying Jesus, right? And we're just kind of, we're just saying that together. At the beginning of service, we're all saying Jesus. It's a form of trumpet. We're just blowing that trumpet. We're just declaring Jesus, Jesus. But what happens sometimes for some of us, for whatever reason, is that you like to blow your own horn. It's like, da -da 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 -da, right? And you're just kind of like blowing your own horn. And the Lord is saying like, no, no, you don't, don't blow your, your own horn. You have to blow the trumpet of God. And it's through there, it's through, it's through Him, it's through declaring Him. That's why the Bible tells us that it's the way that we overcome the enemy, the way that we overcome the devil, is by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. When we're speaking of God's goodness, there's power there, because we're giving God glory. Earlier we seen the Lord said, yeah, you know what, you guys are too much of you, because if, you, if I just let all of you guys win this battle, then you're going to say that it's all you. And that's why like, when, when we do Tuesday nights or if I'm in a setting, I'll always ask people for a testimony. And the reason why is because when they share testimony, they're, they're releasing power. They're releasing, they're blowing this trumpet that's saying that God is big. And I notice God in the small, small things in my life and God is there. And God helped heal my mom or God helped do this. I was looking for a job and somebody showed up and all of a sudden they got this job or somebody else needed a job. They showed up and I just so happened to have information they got a job, now they can feed their family, and then they glorify God. And they say, look, God is here, God is here, God is all over the place. And that is just the word of our testimony. God becomes alive in all these different places, blowing that trumpet. So the word of the Lord over all of us um, this morning, I believe, is this, is that in your earthen vessels, when it's cracked and when it's broken, will Jesus' light, will that light shine bright? Because for many people, you are the only hope that they'll have to get to know the Lord. In this time and, and in this season of, of life, many people are going to be fearful. It's going to get, I, I'm not being a, uh, what do you call that? Like an alarmist or the, what do you, like a fear, what's it called? Um, you know, those kind of doomsday kind of people. And even though we talk about the future and we talk about the blood wounds and like, you know, heads up, things are going to, could change. People say, oh, like, why would you say that? Like, why would you speak those kind of words? And, you know, if the Bible says that these are the things to look for, Look, to look for and then that these are going to be the beginning signs or birth pangs of things to come then we need to subscribe to the Bible and at the same time not to be fearful because if you're fearful that you were missing this perfect love because perfect love casts out all fear is that right? so this morning I'm going to pray over all, all of us this morning that the perfect love of God would come upon every single one of us and before I do that um, if I can invite the worship team we'd like to give every single person the opportunity to have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The Bible says that every single one of us have sinned. And Uncle Francis stood here and said, like, have any, do, are any of you perfect? And the answer is no. We're, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, when we call upon His name, when we call upon His name and believe in our heart, confess Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that He is the Lord and Savior, because of His finished work, we can have be ushered into eternal life. So if you've never received Jesus Christ, we want to give you that opportunity. So with your heads bowed, with your eyes closed, I want to ask you at this time, if you've never received Jesus, you've never called upon his name, when I said that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and you said to yourself, no, the Holy Spirit doesn't live inside of me because I've never been called upon him to live in my life. If that's you and you want to receive Jesus Christ, you want him to reside in you, you want him to occupy your life, you want to make him the Lord, the Savior, the King of your life, if you'd like to do that this morning, we're just going to ask you from where you're sitting to just raise your hand. We're going to pray for you. That God would come into you and save you from your sins. I see your hand there. Church, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. And brother, as we're praying this prayer, we'll, we'll give the words you just add the heart. Let's pray this together. Dear God, Thank you for Jesus. I believe that Jesus lived a perfect life and died on the cross as a sacrifice for me. Jesus died and was risen 
and is alive today and is here with me today. I ask for forgiveness of all my sin. I turn away from that old person. I turn away from my old habits, my old thinking. That person has passed away. I turn to you, Jesus. You are my King, my Savior, and I will trust in you. From this day forward, I will live a life thinking on Jesus. Speaking of Jesus, living for Jesus, and in Jesus' name, all fear is cast out of me. Perfect love resides in me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we say congratulations and praise the Lord? You know, speaking about this light that's inside of that, that this inside of you, it's so important that we remember who you are as a born again believer, as a born again Christian, the power that resides inside of you. We're just gonna close this video and then we're gonna pray together. If we can get the lights, let's take a look at this. It's entitled Identity. Are you blessed this morning? Thank you for um, 
withstanding. I know it gets a little warm as we sit here in the editor. Um, but praise the Lord, you know, as I, I was as I was sweating myself, I, I'm just mindful that, you know what, praise God that we can meet like this. Truly, truly praise the Lord for that. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for all the different things that you've spoken to our hearts this morning, Lord. We thank you that you would remind us that we will all face strife, that we will all face the Midianites of our own lives. But you have given us the solution. You have given us the answer. We know that in our lives, Lord, that we could be walking through a test that we don't even know that we're being tested, tested by you for the things that you have called us for, for the things that you want us to do. We pray, Lord, that we would be those that would be able to pass our tests. Or that we would be those kind of people that would be at the right place at the right time. That every single one of us has a place called there. And we pray, Lord, that as we chase you and as we follow you, that you would allow us to be at the right place at the right time. For protection's sake, for prosperity's sake, for the sake of glorifying your name. We thank you, Lord, that we are mindful and are reminded today that we are these earthen vessels. And within these earthen vessels lives your light. The light of Jesus Christ that you have called every single one of us to shine in this world. We thank you, Lord, for that trumpet, for the ability to speak of your goodness, to declare, proclaim Jesus Christ in this world. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have spoken to us this morning. And we know, Lord, that during this time, during this season, and world events going on, that even though the world may be going crazy, that you would speak to us that you would help us, that you would be with us in a time of trouble, that we would make you our refuge, our strong place, and our shelter, and our tower. We will trust in you, Lord Jesus. We will all trust in you. We thank you for what you are doing. We thank you for blessing us throughout this week. We give you all the glory, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you, church.